Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, Cetarelli for governor. Will the third time be the charm? The former assemblyman who narrowly lost to Governor Murphy last election cycle makes his long-awaited announcement for 2025. I very humbly, but with unwavering determination and balanced energy, declare my candidacy to be your next governor. Plus, how will he match up against an already crowded field of gubernatorial hopefuls? If we wind up with another primary next year that doesn't have the line, then this really is going to be the voter's choice, and they're going to get a full range of options. Also, school cuts. Education advocates descend on the state capitol as more than 140 school districts face a slash in funding. And brace yourself for a summer fare hike. New Jersey Transit unanimously approves a 15% fare increase for the rails and roads. This fare hike, while presented as a partial solution to address the agency's financial challenges, effectively places the greatest burden on those who depend on public transit the most. Our future cannot be car dependent. It's unsustainable. It's unfair. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Jack Cetarelli is running for governor again, officially launching his third campaign bid for the state's highest office, making good on his promise to get back in the race after nearly unseating Governor Phil Murphy in the 2021 election, coming within just three points of the vote. Cetarelli made the announcement in Freehold last night, vowing that if elected, he'll lower business and property taxes taxes and overhaul public school curriculum. The 62-year-old from Central Jersey has a lengthy career in public office with the Raritan Borough Council, the Somerset County Board of Commissioners, before winning a seat in the Assembly, where he represented the 16th District for seven years. So his announcement comes as no surprise, but it offers serious competition to moderate GOP Senator John Bramnick, who's already tossed his hat in the ring. And a senior political correspondent, David Cruz, reports comes with an unpredictable factor, Donald Trump. I very humbly, but with unwavering determination and balanced energy, declare my candidacy to be your next governor. In front of a packed room in Freehold last night, Jack Cetarelli launched his third campaign for governor, fine-tuning a message that he hopes will strike a middle ground with entreaties to moderates and a pinch of red meat to conservatives, promising to be a candidate who understands that campaigns are won by addition, not subtraction or division. A candidate who can unite our party, not one who calls moderate Republicans rhinos or Trump supporters crazies. A candidate who can convince Democrats to support our ideas. While at the same time calling on people who want to empower parents and improve education for our children, and people who want to revitalize our cities, keep our neighborhoods safe, people who want to secure the border and ban sanctuary cities and us becoming a sanctuary state. Republican leaders in New Jersey say their party is energized with more registered Republicans than ever and a standard bearer at the top of the ticket this year that has them unified, enough to have Cetarelli go from calling the former president a charlatan unfit for office to proclaiming yesterday. I think the country was better off during Donald Trump's four years than Joe Biden's four years. I'm not a political pundit, but Donald Trump's not winning New Jersey. So the people running against me are out there trying to be more Trump than the other person. Well, knock yourself out, because you can get in a general election, they're going to smoke you. Senator John Bramnick, the first Republican candidate in the race, has staked out the never-Trumper lane 
He says, even if Trump's policies are more in line with the GOP, everything else about him is bad for the country. He says Cedarelli will eventually have to explain himself to voters beyond the party's base. Because you're never going to explain why you went to a Stop the Steal rally, why you supported somebody who, in my judgment, inspired a riot and says that all the criminals who beat police officers up are hostages. Is that is that the party of law and order? Uh, I don't think so. Democrats in Blue Jersey still think Trump is a political gift, but this is a state that likes to switch it up sometimes. Tom Kane Sr. and Chris Christie both followed two-term Democratic administrations. Republican Assemblyman Brian Bergen was at the Cedarelli event yesterday, but is uncommitted at the moment. He says Republican candidates are best served by being consistent in their messaging about Trump either way. Is it easier for Republicans in New Jersey in 25 if Trump wins or if he loses? It's 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 really hard to say. I, I would honestly say probably if he wins, uh, it would be easier for because I think I, I like Trump. I think Trump was a good president. There's got a lot of flaws, as does every president. But I think he's an effective president. So if Trump gets in office and can deliver on really good, tangible policies, then um, then it takes away some of the uh, the anti-Trump rhetoric that's out there that's really devastating to the Republican Party right now. It's a complicated relationship. A recent poll has Trump trailing President Joe Biden by just single digits in New Jersey which suggests that Trump might not be as potent a weapon for Democrats come 2025. For now, though, proximity to Trump remains the leading issue for Republicans. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And be sure to join David tomorrow on Chatbox, where he'll go one-on-one -on -one with Jack Cittarelli about why this race is different from the others and whether the third run is indeed the charm. That's Thursday at 6 p.m. on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Well, now that Cettarelli has firmly planted his flag in the gubernatorial race, he joins a crowded field of contenders. We mentioned Republican John Bramnick, who is so far Cettarelli's biggest competitor in the primary, but also Democrats Steve Fulop, Ras Baraka, and Steve Sweeney. That list is only expected to grow, making it a much different playing field than the election four years ago. So does a center-right candidate like Cettarelli have a clear path forward? I asked Micah Rasmussen, director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics at Ryder University. So, Micah, good to have you, as always, uh, especially on a day like this. This has now become an increasingly widened field. What do you make so far of the cast of candidates we have? Well, it's a very full field that we're talking about, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, um, that's developing. Voters are going to have a lot of choices. And if we wind up with another primary next year that doesn't have the line, then this really is going to be the voter's choice. And they're going to get a full range of options. Uh, Jack, se Jack Cedarelli seems to be carving out a um, center-right position, yeah. but you're going to have candidates to the right of him, maybe like Bill Spadia, and candidates to the left of him, like John Bramnick. So I think they're going to get a full range of options. Yeah. Does not having the line hurt a candidate like Cedarelli more? I mean, he's someone who picked up all 21 right. Republican Party organization endorsements back in the last race in 2021. It's a very good point and a great question. I think he will be strong enough, given his statewide name recognition, that he will do well either under a line system or without one. Mm. Um, he'll sort of rise to the top of the pack just because people know a lot about him. This is his third run um, for governor statewide. So um, I think he'll do well under either rules. But as you say, he probably has the most to lose given that he has those relationships with every county organization and has maintained them, has really gotten around the state for these last two and a half years and the four years before that. Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing since his announcement, and we've been talking about, of course, he's been this sort of candidate that hasn't gone away, for lack of a better word. I mean, he's got a lot more at stake when you look at it from through that lens. But how does he differentiate himself from someone like a John Bramnick, who I am guessing he's the two are going to be compared uh, the most. Yes. So even last night uh, during his announcement, he tried to draw some parallels. He 
said that Bramnick uh, works too closely with Democrats. He said, you know, he all but said, this is a guy who voted for Matt Platkin as attorney general, mm. voted to confirm him. And so, so that's really a message for the more right uh, it is. Uh, yes. members of the party. Yeah, so I think he's going to try to make himself um, a little bit to the right of Bramnick, but not as far as Spadia. He's going to go for that center right uh, positioning if he can get away with it. He's what does he need to do with his messaging when it comes to Donald Trump? Well, he has thrown himself in. He's endorsed Trump. Um, and so you're going to have a never Trumper in the race. You're going to have Bramnick, who very clearly has said that this is not the direction for New Jersey, New Jersey Republicans. And you're going to have Cittarelli, who has said, I am endorsing him. Um, I am supporting him. I am throwing myself in with him. So a lot depends on who wins this presidential race. Right. Um, if it's Trump, there's almost certainly going to be, New Jersey becomes almost the first um, uh, midterm state, right? Where we become the first state where we have the earliest midterm election. That's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, okay, so if we look at these candidates as a whole and we know that the pendulum tends to swing from Democrat to Republican mm -hmm. after Murphy having served eight years, um, what's the path forward then for someone like Cedarelli? I mean, you said he's got to sort of differentiate himself, but Folks in New Jersey do like moderates. They do. And you heard some of that last night. He tried to speak to property tax freezes. Well, that sounded a lot like the Democrats' platform from 2023, which didn't go so well for yeah. Republicans last year. He also had a little bit of uh, tilting at the windmills, not to, you know, <laughs> not that he's Don Quixote, but, um, and he was back on the parental rights stuff. So, again, that cycle didn't go so well for Republicans. He's going to have to make a, a more compelling case. Uh, for why that would be different than what we had last year. In districts, it didn't go so well for Republicans. It's going to even be a more uphill climb to run statewide on those kinds sure. of issues that didn't play and district wide. We'll remind everyone this is still a year away, more than in 2025. Micah, thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate Thank you. it. There's another twist in the federal corruption trial of U.S. Senator Bob Menendez. It now faces a possible delay. The U.S. Department of Justice today sent a letter to the federal judge presiding over the case, stating prosecutors agree with a recent request by his wife, Nadine Menendez, to delay the trial, which was slated to start May 6 by at least two months. This after her lawyers asked for an adjournment because she was recently diagnosed with a serious medical condition. Lawyers aren't disclosing details about the condition, but said it would require surgery within four to six weeks and possibly significant follow-up and recovery treatment. In a letter to the judge, U.S. prosecutors wrote they, quote, take seriously the unexpected medical development, calling for a status conference on June 4th to check in on her health, but also denied the request for an indefinite adjournment. A delay will also impact her husband's trial. And it's not the first time the embattled senator has asked for a postponement since being indicted for a bribery scheme last September. It's now up to the judge to decide whether the trial should be postponed until later this summer. Police are investigating vandalism at an Islamic center at Rutgers University as a possible bias crime. The Center for Islamic Life shared images today on social media of shattered windows, smashed religious artwork, broken TVs, and a torn Palestinian flag. The break-in occurred last night during an event for Eid, which marks the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Governor Murphy and the attorney general confirming there is a criminal investigation underway and saying there's no tolerance for acts of hate against the Muslim community. Leaders at the center say the vandalism was fueled by Islamophobia toward Rutgers' Muslim population. It all comes as tensions are rising on the campus over the war in Gaza and calls from some student organizations for the university to divest its endowment from Israeli companies and cut ties with Tel Aviv University. State education leaders were in the hot seat today, testifying at the State House before the Assembly Budget Committee as lawmakers grapple with balancing a budget that, on one hand, increases state aid to schools by nearly a billion dollars, but also cuts funding to more than 100 districts. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, several legislators are proposing fixes to the problems in their own districts, but it's unclear if any offer a permanent fix. With this milestone, 
Keystone mm -hmm. comes an infusion of $908 million in K-12 formula aid and a preschool funding increase of $124 million. Acting Education Commissioner Kevin Damer addressed the Assembly Budget Committee in a hearing today to explain Governor Murphy's proposed education budget that finalizes a seven-year phase-in of the S-2 school funding formula. This additional funding will bring our total K-12 formula aid to nearly $11.7 billion and our total funding for preschool will surpass $1.2 billion. This direct support to our schools now exceeds 24% of the entire state budget. The plan will once again fully fund the state pension system, allocates $4.5 million to literacy programs, $800,000 for after-school and summer programs for at-risk students, nearly $2 million for AP and college credit courses, and $15 million to expand mental health services for schools. But foremost on legislators' minds today was that funding formula that's increased funding to 460 districts, but left 140 of them facing budget cuts. Do you think that the property value is a fair way to gauge a local property taxpayer's ability to pay for funding of schools? Using property, property taxes. Values, yes. Property taxes are, are a vital part of funding our schools. It's, a, it's one of the three components. We've got local property taxes, state, state support, and federal support. Damer explaining that the costs of educating a student are also calculated into the formula, along with a community's ability to pay and declining enrollment, something the department says is part of the explanation for some of the 140 districts losing funding, but some are losing double-digit percentages year over year. In my district, Hawthorne, is losing 880-some-odd thousand, which is, I believe, roughly 18 uh, percent. You know, I got from their school board, you know, they're down 20 kids from last year. So I was just trying to understand like how sure. we got there to this point where they're staring down the barrel of an 18% reduction. It's looking at the school community and the costs associated with running schools for that number of students that have these types of, of needs. The other side is, okay, how do we share that cost between the state and, and local piece? That's a question several lawmakers are trying to answer. A number of bills have been proposed that offer stopgap funding to those districts facing cuts. One, proposed by Democrats in the 6th and 16th districts, appropriates nearly $71.5 million that districts can apply for. Another bill from Senators Bucco and O'Scanlan would restore $200 million in funding to losing districts. And a companion bill from Republicans Republicans in District 9 would limit the cut a district could face to no more than 1% of the year prior. But it all boils down to this question for Assemblyman Al Barlas. Why are we doing all this? Why are we having to do supplemental bills? Why are we having to kick, you know, extend these deadlines? You guys propose the budget, right? You can, S2 is a piece of it, but you can also add other stuff into it to figure out how to fund these districts. If the, anybody, uh, the legislature were, were to choose to move forward with those, then we would um, obviously work to implement those. This is the school funding formula that we have on the books. It's the statutory formula we're carrying out and now for the first time ever fully funding it. So even though this proposed budget has fully funded the formula, we could end up seeing a patchwork of funding models going to some districts, leaving this process for them as clunky and uncertain as it's ever been. In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Well, for the first time ever, the Environmental Protection Agency set new rules to keep toxic forever chemicals out of drinking water. The regulations target six chemicals that are part of the larger PFAS family, substances that are commonly used in a range of products because they repel water and they're fire resistant. But those same properties mean the chemicals can take thousands of years to break down in the environment, making them toxic to people. PFAS have been linked to cancers, birth defects and other health effects, and the contamination is widespread. It can be found everywhere. The new drinking water rules surpass existing state standards. Water systems around the state will have to invest in new treatment technologies to deal with PFAS. The EPA also announced a new $1 billion investment in water infrastructure nationwide to help, and a raft of lawsuits are trying to force chemical companies that make and use PFAS to pay up. Just last week, chemical giant 3M agreed to a $10 billion settlement that will pay for drinking water investments around the country.
In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, the cost to ride the rails is officially going up. In a unanimous vote today, New Jersey Transit's Board of Directors approved a 15 percent fare hike for bus and train riders. It's the first rate increase at the agency in nearly a decade. The new prices go into effect July 1st and will get a 3 percent annual bump every summer after that. The move is intended to help New Jersey Transit close a more than $100 million budget gap it's facing in the upcoming fiscal year. As Ted Goldberg reports, opponents made one final plea to the board today, but their protests fell short. This vote pains me very, very much. It also pains anybody who rides NJ Transit, who will now have to pay up to 15 percent more starting in July. Before voting unanimously to raise prices, Board members explained their vote. The alternative uh, to filling that budget gap is cutting services. And I think cutting services really does a disservice to working families in New Jersey. In terms of job losses, that's going to be devastating to uh, our fellow citizens who work very hard for this agency. While we are planning for historic events like the World Cup and working to build ridership back to pre-pandemic levels, it's never been more important to ensure that NJ Transit has sufficient, stable, and predictable funding for the short and long-term need for all our services and customers. Public comment was also unanimous. It's not right. It's unconscionable. Hoboken Mayor Ravi Bala, who is also running for Congress, was among the large groups stopping by today's NJ Transit Board meeting, airing their grievances. When you have higher increases, you get more people on it driving cars, you get higher carbon emissions and you increase the problems that we're already facing with a, a climate crisis. So how is this good policy? People like Bala criticized the board's vote and went as far as to question the board's independence. They say that this, this board of New Jersey Transit is nothing, nothing more than a rubber stamp of the governor's policy. And if that's the case, resign or at least look at in the mirror next time you get a chance and know that you're not an independent board, you're just here doing somebody else's business, not the public's. People have asked us um, if we're rubber stamps uh, for the governor. I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else here, but for myself, I will tell you uh, I am not. It is not a yes, just as a rubber stamp, it's a yes considering all the factors that we discussed and that you've heard from my colleagues. Before the vote, Activists hoped a last-minute rally could swing some votes. No fair hike! No fair hike! People complained that a fair hike isn't equitable and doesn't address NJ Transit's long-term financial problems. NJ Transit has argued higher prices go a long way to stabilizing their finances. This fair hike, while presented as a partial solution to address the agency's financial challenges, effectively places the greatest burden on those who depend on public transit the most. Our future cannot be car dependent. It's unsustainable. It's unfair. New Jersey Transit knew that this fiscal cliff was coming for years. They should have been planning on large conglomerates and large corporations that would be able to be taxed and a fee given to them. Governor Phil Murphy has proposed a corporate transit fee for New Jersey's biggest businesses that could generate more than $800 million for NJ Transit. But Murphy says that's not a permanent solution. It's just to help NJ Transit get back on its feet. Protesters and NJ Transit board members did agree on something. They want state lawmakers to get involved. Our state lawmakers have failed to adequately fund NJ Transit for years. And now transit riders are going to suffer because of it. At a time when we should be encouraging more people to take public transit, a double digit fare increase is not only punitive, but short sighted. I would encourage the legislature and the governor to find additional sources of funding to ensure that in the future, transit does not have to cut services. This is the first fare increase in nine years for NJ Transit. But under the approved plan, prices will increase 3% each year unless any changes are made. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. On Wall Street, stocks plummeted today after a key inflation report showed an unexpected uptick in consumer prices last month. The CPI was up 0.4% in March. That's ahead of economists' predictions. Here's how the markets closed.
That's going to do it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. For more than a century, New Jersey Realtors has worked to advocate for home ownership and private property rights. Whether it's your home or business, we work on the issues that matter here in Trenton and in your neighborhood. As the voice for real estate in New Jersey, we support initiatives that safeguard home ownership, strengthen communities, and reinforce our economy. Learn more at njrealtor.com.